<laughs> no, thank you, Chairman. Um, well, chemical engineering and energy, which are rather a large topic, really. <clears throat> um, I thought, first of all, that we would remind ourselves about the oil industry. Um, if anything is chemical engineering, then the oil industry is from beginning to end. Um, 100 years ago, it hardly existed at all. Now, this is a sort of typical refinery. They like to have their refineries photographed at night for some reason, but there, there we are. Um, but oil these days provides about 34% um, of the uh, energy <coughs> used in the world. And gas, which is, a, I think we have to say, a related <coughs> uh, industry to the oil industry itself, about 24%. I think in this context, it's rather interesting in the UK to remember that it was the oil industry in the 1970s that um, developed the, uh, what we might call a, a substitute coal gas, comes a substitute town gas uh, by the reforming of naphtha, which completely uh, revolutionized the, the production of gas in this country, um, which had been sort of static for a very long time, certainly from the, from the beginning of the century. And then, of course, no sooner had all that been established, then along came North Sea gas. So um, a, a different branch of chemical engineering was required uh, to, to, uh, to bring natural gas onto the scene. Uh, but um, I, just reverting to um, the oil industry itself and the, I suppose its chief um, product, as far as a lot of people are concerned, is transport fuel. What has been happening in transport fuel recently, uh, I think we can mention the reduction of sulfur in, in, the, uh, in, in uh, motor fuel, uh, which has uh, en enabled the uh, uh, catalytic conversion of um, exhaust uh, uh, pollutants to be uh, enhanced. Um, a lot of, uh, or not a lot, but several uh, non-fossil components are, are now regularly introduced into, uh, in, into the petroleum blend. And there are prospects for producing synthetic fuels that might have enhanced performances as far as uh, transport is concerned and the environmental effects thereof. Uh, if we're interested in hydrogen for transport, then it must be chemical engineers who produce the hydrogen, and for a long time it's going to be from fossil energy sources of one kind or another. Um, and if we're talking about electricity, then chemical engineers have a lot to contribute to the development of improved batteries. I would like to look um, at another field which is not immediately so obvious from a chemical engineering point of view, and that is uh, iron making. We, we have here a typical blast furnace. Um, it is fed with coke um, and uh, iron ore. A hundred years ago, it was, it was black, uh, very much a black art. Even in the 1950s, it was a gray art. And um, I, I remember, not too, too long after that, um, scientists trying to... Uh, convince the glass furnace operators that they had something to offer. Well, they've certainly had a lot to offer in the last 50 years. And uh, we now know a lot more about how to make coke and to um, adjust its properties to, to be uh, um, matched to the requirements of the uh, glass furnace. We now know more about ore preparation than we did. We, know, we certainly know more, a lot more about the chemistry that's going on in the blast furnace, um, not only the uh, combustion at the base of the blast furnace, but also the rather subtle gasification reactions that go and reduction reactions that, that take place halfway up the, uh, the blast furnace. Of course, uh, these days, um, oxygen is fed into the, the tweers. Oxygen is produced by chemical engineers. Um, coal and oil are injected into the tweers. Um, and that is all sort of almost standard chemical engineering practice. So one way or another, um, we, we show here the improvements made in 
iron making, this one shows over the last 50 years, uh, we show the amount of coke required to produce one tonne of iron. And you'll see that this has come dramatically down from, um, well, it was in, in, in 1900s, it was about four tonnes of coal required to make a tonne of, uh, of coke. The theoretical minimum is something about four, 400 kilograms, and we, we're just about reaching that now with all these new improvements that uh, the chemical engineers have brought into the, um, into the picture. I suppose the, the oh, sorry, I suppose one of the mo, more uh, obvious uh, applications of chemical engineering is in the is in the improvement of um, combustion uh, and uh, uh, heat recovery and so on in the power station. Um, here again, we start with coal preparation, um, pneumatic transport to make sure that the coal is, is uh, or fuel is equally distributed around the burners, we have combustion taking place, we have solids deposition, we have heat transfer, um, all sort of standard chemical engineering uh, processes. And uh, I think it's rather interesting that it was almost exactly 100 years ago that the first um, experiments were made um, with um, PF. Uh, I think they were made in America, first of all. Um, but of course, the, and the, the, um, they, they rapidly replaced in uh, the generation of electricity the rather highly inefficient uh, diesel engines that had been used um, until that time. And I try to demonstrate here how the efficiency of power generation has gone up um, over the years with the um, pulverized fuel plant. The, the dates are, are really a bit of a, a, a guess, but we start off with quite low efficiency, 29%, 1960s about 39%, and I think certainly for a long time it's stuck at that sort of level. In fact, I was reading the other day that in America, the average efficiency of PF plant is still only about 33%, which is, which is surprising, uh, because with newer technology, with supercritical, um, about 20 or 30 years ago, and then more modern um, ultra-supercritical plant, uh, efficiencies of uh, these plants have gone up to something like 40, uh, 50 or 55 percent. And one of the technologies which has helped has been the CAD, which uh, computer-aided design, which has um, enabled the um, performance of, of PF boilers to be uh, have much better analysed and hence improved, so that we end up both with a, um, a steady improvement in the efficiency of PF plant, and uh, who knows where we where we end up in the future. But this graph stops at 55, but then there's an encouraging arrow which goes even further. Um, I suppose one of the more obvious. Um, applications of chemical engineering to PF was first of all the uh, cleaning up of the off gas um, to, uh, in respect of sulfur. Uh, this is a limestone washing plant. Um, I know when it was introduced this was regarded as uh, absolutely bizarre that having this chemical engineering plant stuck on the end of a power station it's now really quite accepted and of course the nitrogen reduction plant as well added on. Um, there are a lot of advocates for an alternative to uh, PF. This one, for example, starting with gasification. Uh, this this looks much more in, uh, like a chemical engineering plant from, from start, to, start to finish um, we, because we have the production of synthesis gas, uh, then the shifting the proportions of uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen to make CO2 and hydrogen. Um, one of the advantages of that is that you can then bleed off the CO2 under pressure uh, if you're going to uh, transport it and uh, store it in uh, underground and so on. Um, but there, there are 
there are one or two examples of gasification plants, and uh, some of us would like to see more. But uh, the industry, I think, is, is getting still a little bit worried about the um, about chemical engineering uh, in in uh, take, taking over from the traditional power station, and there's quite a lot of support for uh, modifying, as you might say, the traditional PF plant by uh, using uh, recycled off gas with uh, oxygen enrichment in in place of air as the combustion material so that you end up with a carbon dioxide rich stream uh, which is uh, got obviously much easier to deal with if you're talking about carbon capture and storage and if we are talking about carbon capture and storage then chemical engineers um, are involved in, mo in almost every stage uh, either the, the collection of well, first of all the production of the CO2 as we've said there are various circuits for doing that capturing the CO2 transporting it, standard chemical engineering practice, um, injecting it um, in aquifers or whatever um, seams are, uh, are appropriate, and then uh, monitoring what happens to CO2 underground and dealing with um, uh, oil and, and CO2, if that's what you're doing, if you're recovering oil. Uh, or uh, methane or, or whatever. It's all chemical, it's all sort of standard chemical engineering stuff. So I think um, whatever the, the future of fossil energy uh, is concerned, um, chemical engineers will be involved. Um, and I have to say that although fossil energy power production is not an, on the top of everybody's list in the UK, we have to remember that worldwide, more than five billion tons a year of coal are used for power generation, and, the, and the, that amount is increasing every year. Um, in the future, obviously, nuclear power is going to come in, and I'm going to, I, we're going to hear a lot more about that later on. But um, I would just like to remind nuclear engineers that if it were not for chemical engineers preparing the fuel in the first place, then, then they wouldn't have a, a, a nuclear power stations to play with. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.